Hi everybody, um, thanks for having me. So as we're having the music demo here, I was thinking that this presentation would be a lot more epic with some well-timed uh, music, but I don't know if Aug uh, and us can partner up in the future. So, um, so I'm Dan, I'm the co-founder of Scott Alarm. Wanted to thank David and Andrew, First Mark, uh, for having me and for everyone coming out tonight. Really appreciate it. I'm in from Chicago, and tonight I want to talk a little bit about partners and cash flow. And so we'll get into that in a minute, but um, just trying to figure out a way to extend your runway, especially in the early days of your hardware startup. All right. Good to go. There we go. So um, I'm just going to give you the slightest bit of background here so you know who I am and why I might be talking on this topic. So I am the co-founder of Scout. Our, we're headquartered in Chicago. We create um, do-it-yourself wireless home security systems. So we ran from a crowdfunding campaign in early 2013 all the way through uh, our second, thanks Andrew, all the way through our second production run now and soon on to our third. So we've shipped about 20,000 um, connected devices and trying to scale up the business now. It can hit next, thank you. And so as I was thinking about what I would talk about tonight and what might be interesting for this group, I was trying to think about what's been interesting about our journey, what's been remarkable. And so each of the venture meetings that we're in, each of the hardware entrepreneurs that we talk to, um, the comment is always, I can't believe how far you've gone on so little money. And so um, when we were looking to raise our seed round of capital, everyone told us not to even attempt it without raising 1.5. Uh, preferably two million. And we got it done, we went through crowdfunding um, all the way to first production on 850,000. Um, we almost got it done on 650,000. Um, so we think we do a really good job at um, you know, being scrappy and, and thinking about uh, getting a hardware startup you know, off the ground for very little money. And to date, we're through our production run, our second production run, we're starting on our third, um, and we've done it on another 1.15, so two million. Um, over two and a half years uh, to get where we are, which um, in the hard world is, is pretty good. And so uh, before we talk about the partners, the first thing I want to say is just don't do anything I'm about to tell you unless you've validated your concept, you feel really comfortable that this is the business that you're going to run with through the next uh, few years. Because um, what we're going to talk about around partners and how they can help you uh, expand your runway in the early days, uh, you can burn a lot of bridges if you're not sure. So make sure you've done a crowdfunding campaign or have done a pilot program or have tested that prototype with a core group of users before you go off and, and do this. Um, so it starts with the right partners. So uh, we choose our partners, and I'm talking everything from manufacturers to legal services to consultants. We choose them like we choose investors in that um, anyone will take a fee for service in the, in the analog to that in the investor world is anyone can be sort of a money guy but you want those partners who are going to be with you through it thick and thin. And um, thinking about how that can help your business. So you want to partner up with people who, they have a base of business such that your startup, your hardware project is not going to bankrupt them if, uh, if you go under. Um, willing to float you cash in the terms of uh, accounts receivable. So whether that's, you know, giving you net terms or just saying, hey, you can, we'll float you up to this amount and, and you know, we'll ask for payment when accounts re receivable starts bugging us. Um, it's really helpful, especially at an early stage. And having been involved in startups in the past, so this goes, again, to lawyers, to anyone, people that have been through startups, specifically hardware startups, that's even better, understand the challenges, understand what you're going through. So when you have to make that phone call, if you're missing a payment or your, your debt's starting to rack up with a specific partner, um, it's not nearly as difficult of a conversation. And then finally, you know, choosing someone that looks at you as an investment in their future. So whether that's um, them trying to get you as their next big client for the long term of the firm, or that's helping uh, a person make partner, you want that person to be invested in you um, when you're working with them. So just a couple examples here. So in choosing a manufacturer, um, you know, a lot of factory groups that, you know, aren't Foxconn and, and dealing with uh, the big, big products are looking for that thing that's going to drive volume to their factories over the next five, ten years. 
And so the manufacturer that you choose when you're going through your sourcing um, uh, process should be willing to be flexible. And whether that's delaying non-recurring engineering payments, whether that's floating you net terms, they may not be the cheapest factory, but in the early days when you're dealing with very limited funds, it can be very, very useful to have a factory who's on your side and can you float you, you know, in our case, up to $250,000 at a later date. Um, that's huge, it will dilute you less um, and you have to worry a lot less day to day if you have that, that comfort level. Um, I mentioned legal, so a lot of lawyers know that their fees are you know, very high and many of them that have been involved with startups in the past are willing to delay uh, your payments knowing that if you do grow into a big company, you're going to be there for the long term to pay their outsized fees down the line. And so you're going to need multiple types. If you're doing a hardware startup, you're going to need a corporate lawyer, you're going to need an IP lawyer, you're going to have multiple guys. And a lot of them will be willing to float you 10 to 50K in terms of accounts receivable um, while you get off the ground, knowing that if you succeed, that you'll be with them for the long term. So thinking about that, that's another $100,000 bucket, let's call it, that you can uh, take advantage of in the early days. And then consultants. So specifically with Scout, we worked with a design consulting firm. Um, and one of the challenges that consultants face is that they don't have a lot of work that they can put out there publicly. A lot of it's confidential, it might be for Fortune 500 companies, um, and a lot of it goes and dies on a server, to be honest with you. They don't get to see things hit the shelves, or if they do, it's three to five years down the road, and they've moved companies. So a lot of consultants out there are, are really interested in getting their work out there, um, seeing their stuff on the shelves, and same thing, willing to um, either give you net terms, float you a little bit on the accounts receivable front, and if they're good, they'll, you know, they'll do a trial. Say, hey, try, try us out first, and if we, if we work well together, we can do a services for equity deal, or um, you can pay us later. And again, we were able to do that for you know, up to $150,000. So um, if you talk to other founders, other makers, um, investors, everybody knows a guy um, whether you're looking for legal or manufacturers, they can help you find those people that can help extend your runway. And the benefits of going and finding them early is that you're sharing risk. So now they have some skin in the game. So when you're 30 days from running out of cash and you have an investor come to you with a term sheet, you need to evaluate it quick. Your lawyer who you know, wants to be paid his accounts receivable is willing to you know, work on that deal, make it happen because he knows it's for the best of both of you. So you're sharing the risk, you both have skin in the game. As I mentioned earlier, it's a lot easier to take that phone call or make the phone call when you can't pay your bills if they know that there's a chance up front that you won't. It's the partners that don't expect you as a startup not to make a payment that when you run up a bill with them are gonna get very, very angry and that's a very unpleasant conversation. So the more you're able to build that into your business um, in the early days, trust me, it'll help you a lot down the line. And then, you know, uh, the startup friendly is this kind of the bucket I'm calling them, no other startup friendly. So this is kind of a, a snowball effect. You'll meet new people, um, you know, through these networks that can be really helpful to your business and generally are well connected. So specifically in hardware, that's great. Um, like just tonight, being here in from Chicago, it's great to be able to, to talk to different people, you know, connect with a new community. And I'm sure, you know, from this experience, I'll meet some people that down the line, you know, we can work together and help each other out. And the last thing is that uh, oftentimes, this goes back to the consulting thing, is your project as a hardware startup, as a young, uh, cool technology like uh, the AUG, um, that's the most interesting thing they're working on in a day. If they're working on a Fortune 500 client, if they're working on you know, 10 years of legal for the same company, you're the most interesting thing in their day. So people are motivated if you pitch them in the same way that you're pitching investors, they're motivated to help you out because um, it's new, it's novel, it's fun, and they want to see people succeed. Um, we're all in it together. So disclaimer number two, if um, I say all of this with the expectation that you have to know that you're going to pay them back, right? It's not a forever float. It's not something like, oh, I'm gonna you know, use this lawyer and, and jump lawyers. You have to know that you're gonna pay them back, not only with the money, but also with the loyalty, right? If they help you get off the ground, do pay your bills, 
you know, do accept some outsized fees in the future um, because it helps you off the ground. That's the most risky time for your hardware startup is in the early days. So it's important that, that you're committed to being loyal to them long term. And so if you validated demand, if you're committed to a long-term relationship, I just named a couple of buckets, there are certainly others, but you can easily find you know, up to half a million dollars in float from your partners um, as you're going through your hardware startup. And that is immensely helpful as you're getting off the ground and uh, you know, trying to meet production runs, um, trying to fulfill customer orders. And I'll give you just one quick example before I finish. Um, we had some risk buys that we had to do because like every crowdfunding campaign, our crowdfunding campaign was way late. Um, so we had to do some risk buys on the uh, production front. We had to do some spot market buys. And so if you're able to do things like this where you can have a couple pockets of cash that you know, uh, can accrue with these partners, when a risk buy comes and you have $5,000 in PCBs that go down the drain and now are just you know, decoration for your next office, uh, this comes in really, really handy uh, versus if you're paying everything you know, fee for service up front. And so there are uh, wild, wild swings in hardware. The more cushion you can build in, whether it's you know, through investment, through partners, um, the better. So um, yeah, I hope that helps you guys extend your runway with your, your hardware startups and uh, go out there and find the right partners. That was awesome. Thank you very much. And, uh, yeah, it's always great when people like you take the time to just like share lessons as opposed to spending 15 minutes uh, pitching the product. Um, but since you were very kindly did that, do you want to tell us a little bit about uh, Scout? You mentioned at the beginning of are you at the company? What, what sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we are uh, we are do-it-yourself wireless home security system. We have four core devices right now. Um, so it's all connected home security. Um, we run an 802.15.4 uh, protocol. Um, we have open closed sensors, motion sensors, an RFID door access panel. Um, we are on our third production run and we are actively trying to scale the business. So trying to get distribution, trying to get partners that can help us you know, get the word out, uh, put it in front of their install base. We're working on version two of the product. So um, you're starting to think again about the hardware. Um, you know, when you're in the process, you kind of like, oh, it's so frustrating. And then you get away from it and get more into the business side where it's just about scale and customer acquisition. And that's all great, but getting back to the hardware is always fun. So that's what we're looking forward to do over the next um, few months and uh, working on video camera as well. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well. So, uh, one question, two parts. Uh, anything you did differently about the manufacturing? And also, uh, can you speak to the potential in crowdfunding the manufacturing uh, to gain uh, iterative feedback from your customers and customers along the way? How small a run can you do? And how tightly can you integrate that feedback? Yeah. <clears throat> um, it does vary, I think, I'll answer your second question first. It does vary. Um, by product, I think. And so um, we were kind of on the cusp. You know, we sold about $200,000 worth of devices in our 30-day window. I uh, went on to sell about half a million dollars worth of devices. Um, and so we were just at the cusp where, should we go to China? Should we stay domestic? Um, and we ended up going to China knowing that our goal was to, to scale this rather quickly. And our minimum order quantity is, is 1,500 units of our base station. And we order multiples of each other sensor. Um, and so uh, the crowdfunding was great because in, we had a long delay, like just being honest, we had a very long delay. And so getting prototypes in people's hands, being able to build that into you know, the next iteration and, and through the manufacturing you're going to go through EV, probably two versions of DV, PV, you know, all of these things, right? Um, you do have that chance to build in. And some of our favorite features were actually brought up by the crowd. So we have a, a secret RFID sticker that you can hide around your house. Um, and, and arm and disarm, and that was totally you know one of our backers that just reached out, and it was a very simple, elegant solution that we were able to incorporate. Um, but we learned a lot uh, about range through prototyping. That was a pain, um, and we were able to incorporate that feedback. And I'm I'm blanking on your first question. Uh, anything you've done differently? 
Lots of things, yeah. <laughs> I mean, at the end of the day, we, we chose, like, we, we worked with Dragon Innovation. We chose the manufacturer that we were happy with. We put out a version one hardware product that, you know, isn't catching on fire. Like, there's a lot of good things that happen, but, you know, every day, like, you know, you get a PCB run that is $5,000 down the drain, or you spot buy a part and then you find it. The supplier found, you know, 10 cartons of it in the back of the warehouse. There's things you do that you're going to make mistakes. There's just no way to avoid it. And um, you just try to surround yourself with those right partners to, to make it right. Thanks a lot. Uh, yeah. Great chat. Um, the question I have is just, yeah, so there you go. Uh, especially when you're on a very tight budget. Just yell it out. Okay. So when you're on a really tight budget at the beginning, uh, how did you decide what skills, like in your early production, what skills to go to a consultant for or to try to outsource versus maybe either learning yourselves or just hiring for? How did you, how did you make that decision? Was this, you know, yeah. yeah. I think I, what's that? Yeah, so he was asking how we decided what skills um, we would hire for versus outsource in the early days when we had limited funding. Um, and I think the way we did it, and I don't know if it's the right way to do it, but the way we did it was we looked at risk. And so our biggest risk was going down this path and putting out a, um, a, a version one of the hardware that was either problematic or um, you know, just was dead on arrival, right? That's your biggest risk in a hardware store. You have one shot at it, and then you can build from there. And so we surrounded ourselves on the hardware front, whether it was um, you know, engineers with multiple, you know, many years of experience, whether it was Dragon Innovation, um, companies that uh, could mitigate that risk for us. We felt very comfortable on the design side. That's my background. Uh, my CTO on the engineering side. Felt very comfortable with the apps, the website, the back end, but um, the, the the firmware itself and and getting through that first production run, we knew it was critical. So that's where we spent the money. Yeah. Um, how many versions of I gathered went through various versions? Right? Yeah. So how many did you go through until you got to your first product? And did you leverage three at all? Or yeah, absolutely. So um, I would say from February of 20, well, actually earlier than that, probably the summer of 2012 through um, the summer of 2014 was all, you know, prototyping. So um, we did a, a, you know, every time we were making an enclosure, we'd certainly use 3D printers. Um, we had our I call it three versions of the prototype before we put it in front of a manufacturer. And then from there, you're going to iterate further because your prototype is probably not even close to being ready for mass production. So they're going to put it through their, uh, their paces. And so you have you know, the EV prototype phase, your DV runs, you may get one or two of those, and then PV, which is some sellable products. So that's, that's kind of the process we followed to get to our final design. Um, I'd say the industrial design was the most consistent throughout, um, from like version three of the prototype on through EV, PV, all that stuff. Um, that was the most consistent. It was mostly iterating on the boards themselves. All right. Perfect. <laughs> well, thank you so much, guys. Yeah. I just want to, yeah, actually, we have One more? Oh, okay. Great. Yeah, sure. So did you leverage mostly uh, US resources, especially for the critical parts such as firmware? Yes. Uh, yeah. So everything was, was designed and, and uh, developed here? Yes. So in Chicago, so early on we partnered up with a company um, in Chicago called MB Labs. Um, they helped us out with some of the early um, board routing, the early firmware. Um, we ended up hiring uh, a firmware person to come on full time um, for us. Uh, but you know, you know, Dragon's based in Boston, and they have um, also offices in, in Hong Kong. So we had the dual threat there, being able to communicate with the U.S. office, but also having the the engineers on the ground in China um, helping us out. Did Dragon help you also with the development side? No, they do offer it, I believe. But we did all of the all of the software ourselves. We did all of the well, I would call it 99% of the PCB routing ourselves. Um, just brought their engineers for validation, and also the manufacturer is great about you know supplying R and D uh, engineers to to validate. So, yeah. Uh, 
All right. Thank you very much. Right. Thanks, everybody.